Hi there, this is Bernie um, with Connections Consulting, but it's on Sunday, uh, Mother's Day the 10th, and uh, just before I call my mother here this today and wish her a happy Mother's Day, I wanted to, uh, and my brothers and I all live in the area close to my mom, so we visit her even in COVID times on her front porch and stuff, and uh, I just did that the other day. I'm sure one of my other brothers is there visiting her today as I was checking, but uh, we're all closely and tightly in touch and uh, stay with mother on that cause of her being older and, and wanting her boys to be around her. So she's in church right now, I'm sure, online. Her reverend there does broadcasts over YouTube and Facebook Live, so uh, I'm sure they're hearing the good wisdom of the word myself. Um, as I have normally done throughout a lot of my life, um, even in non-COVID times, uh, some Sundays I just like to apportion my time to myself and uh, rest and sleep in a bit because I've worked hard all week or I go for a drive sometimes and look at nature and sit on the hill and watch the sunrise or sunset. I suppose have a coffee. I picked up my free coffee from A&W today. Once in a while they give you one of those coupons in the mail that you get a free coffee, so I went and got that. And I uh, had a nice breakfast and all that, so I'm having church myself this morning uh, in a scriptural way. And you know, I suppose, you know, it's a good way to think individually as well as being a part of a group of friends or an organization if you do go to, a, you know, attend a church. Um, I like to think that uh, you have to have some individual self-esteem and sustain that on your own because, uh, and as I'll, as I'll be alluding to in the scriptures here, on Judgment Day, we stand alone before the Lord. A measure of our whole entire life on earth before we pass into heaven, if we choose that belief to believe in Jesus who takes us to heaven. And... Uh, I'm uh, I'm a firm believer. You got to know, you got to decide and know how you interpret things in life and what you see and what your cause is. But uh, on Judgment Day, there's nobody there holding my hand as an individual. It's my entire life unfolded, and my account given before the Lord based on what I did with my life and how I did it, and on top of what my belief is. So, you know. There's no strength in numbers when it comes to that at the end of the day. No pastor is holding your hand, no group of people, no church organization, not even your hockey team, nobody, your friends at work. So it's good to know and spend a bit of time by yourself once in a while knowing, I suppose, what you know before the Lord. So I wanted to just, this is kind of like I'll equivocally... Uh, you know, rate this as my own church. This is the church of Bernie, so to speak. My home, my dwelling. And that is the highest church order of me, like as far as where I find my own peace. Nobody else can tell me. I'm before God in my life and my doings. Uh, you know, I'm under Him, under His covering. And uh, some people choose to be under, pe under other people, I suppose, but that's an individual choice we all got to make. So I want to turn to you uh, from Scripture today. And, uh, you know, often during the week when I teach you, and I touched on a few scriptural things this week in some of my marketplace teaching, I might refer back to that a bit. But not much. It's all newer stuff here I want to show you. But, uh, you know, I, I often talk out of the Good Samaritan Life Pro humanitarian nonprofit side of my company and quote those scriptural references, and uh, you know, and then and then I do a lot of business training on the fundamentals in a marketplace kind of way. So it gives you both the equivocal exposure to your own life and building. Today I just want to sort of read some scripture to you and passages. You can take those into your own life, into your account, um, into your own human person, for your own body, mind, spirit personal leadership development but it'll be mostly that this is almost quirky like a little church service if you want to view it that way but it it isn't it's just me bernie who you know from connections connection consulting 
reading you a little bit of scripture, I suppose. Now, here is something, and it's equivocally one of the best kind of passages you can read to get in and strengthen your spirit, I suppose, in COVID times. You know, we're not subject to these plagues. We have power over them, not in our strife or economy of, you know, getting down under them and saying, yeah, this sickness has me, this disease or whatever. You can strengthen your spirit by believing the 7,000 plus promises the Lord has given to mankind in the Holy Scripture. So here's Psalm 116. I was referring to this earlier in the week. I love the Lord. Because he has heard my voice. So he hears our cries and our prayers to him. He's, he's heard my supplications. That's another word for prayer. Because he has inclined his ear unto me. So therefore it, it says, it shows you God's listening when you speak. He knows us each personally. He knows who we are. Therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. So that's a good exhortation to stay faithful to praying before God. Asking him to meet your needs in your time of struggle and suffering, I suppose, during COVID, perhaps. The sorrows of death compassed me and encamped all around me, is what that means. And the pains of hell got a hold upon me. Well, COVID's kind of like hell. It's certainly not a gift from the Lord. I found trouble and sorrow. And then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord I beseech thee, deliver my soul. So that's a good prayer right from Scripture, just about our own accord of deliverance from this COVID thing into a better situation in this life, but also into our eternity. Now I'm going to flip over to the book of Matthew. And this resides in Matthew chapter 5, I see. And uh, suppose, you know, this was back in Jesus' day, um, when he was sitting on the mountainside with his disciples, right at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus taught on the earth for three consecutive years and did healing ministry and miracles. And I suppose, and then he, uh, that's when he ascended to heaven after his death and crucifixion on the cross that we all heard about so much at Easter, I suppose. So when he was done his life, his 30 years of upbringing and training in construction ministry as a carpenter under his dad, I suppose, and all that, lived with his mom and his brothers. He had uh, six siblings, I believe. I'd have to double check that. So he learned how to interact as a family and grow in the fortitude of a good heritage, I suppose, under his mother in the earthly way. And that day, the Jewish realm of the teaching of Bible scripture and just the way of life in the economy of a small town on a in the countryside and then his dad taught him the skill of carpentry and he learned the building foundations of building and the structural approach one upon another you don't get the roof the top immediately you got to start with the foundation and build up and the walls and the roof and the windows and all that I suppose so then he went on and he was launched into his ministry by God through the witness of John the Baptist, who prayed for him in a baptism scenario in the ceremony in, uh, in a lake or pond. And, uh, and then the Holy Spirit from heaven, the Holy Ghost, filled him. And then he started his ministry and started doing these wonderful miracles and stuff. But he taught people principles. And this is where I equate to it a lot because of my teaching in the uh, market with the business company connections consulting I like to refer to the ancient history and the scriptural reference of those principles and a good CEO or a good leader in a business corporation will always know a good executive manager and I've had this done to me many times as a leader working for others and I've also done it to people I've led at the beginning of their time with the people, they set expectations. They go into their boardroom or meeting room and give them, this is what I don't like happening around here. This is what I do like. And they give them, they set expectations. Well, here's what Jesus said, and it starts out in verse 5. This is what he said to his disciples. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, in other words, he was ready to go, he set, he was set, his disciples came unto him, 
And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there's some importance in that, that poor in spirit attitude, right? That humility, that humble attitude. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So if you mourn a loss, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You will be comforted. If nothing else, by God alone, you will receive that comfort. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, doing the right thing, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's that law of sowing and reaping or karma. I was alluding to another use of a word. What you put out there comes back to you. And, uh, you know, that's just reality. If you put good vibes out to people, you're going to get good vibes back. It's a spiritual law, I suppose. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you really work at keeping your heart pure, I suppose, in a daily repentance structure where you're wanting to right yourselves with other people, in your spirit, I suppose, keeping it right before God, and in some cases even going and apologizing to another human being if you really felt you hurt their feelings or offended them in any way, well, those kind of people, they shall see God. That's a promise in the scripture right there. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. God's special children are people that keep peace in their community, their neighborhood, in world peace, in bigger structures where presidents rule over countries and so forth, and other leaders have influential roles, like even spiritual leaders that can sway people's thinking to keep peace. Blessed are those people. They will be called God's children. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you're doing the right thing in the marketplace or wherever, and somebody's giving you some flack or conflict about it, it's worth standing up and doing the right thing because it says right in the scriptural law there will be evil or wrong things come against you when you do the right thing. It's just a law of nature. It's a scriptural law. But you know what? When things happen and uh, people give you flack, bad things sometimes happen to good people, you get stronger. The strong shall survive. You develop resilience and blessed are those people, because in the end, when people are falling and withering away like leaves off a tree in Ethiopia, I suppose, there's other people standing up and getting stronger. And you know who you can get around and be friends with are the strong. I'm one of them, okay? Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. That doesn't sound like much fun, does it? I like to be liked by people. Lots of Most of us do, I think. And, and so blessed are you when that happens, and, and when these people shall say all manner of evil against you, falsely for my sake. Well, this is Jesus talking, right? So if you're promoting the good concepts of Jesus, like I am in the marketplace, for example, but anybody in life, anywhere in your life, it might just be in the neighborhood, a mother to another mother who's coaching another mother about something about how to run her kid properly because the other mother has no discipline and was never trained or taught by her own parents. Those are good qualities. And someone, the husband might come home and have a bad attitude about the neighbor mother getting in his way, helping his mother of his kids with, with a wrong attitude he's proposing when really there's just one friend helping another, seeing a flaw in a way and it wasn't working, and the kid was maybe revolting against their parent, and they could help. Well, sometimes people have bad judgments, bad, wrong attitudes. So they, they'll, you got to stand up against those things. If you're doing right, it's the right thing to do. It doesn't mean you poke your nose at every little thing, but why wouldn't you want to help your friend who you love and care about, right? I mean, that's just, that's just a good thing, and. Uh, you know, people respond in wrong ways sometimes because they don't understand truth. 
So it says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Well, not only are you going to get a better friend in this life when you help someone with something they have a flaw in, when you care about them and you want to help them, obviously, but you're, you have a reward in heaven, too. And you never know what might happen. Sometimes people who start out on a wrong track get converted and straightened around. And even the husband who came home mad at you, lady friend of his wife, I suppose, he might end up seeing it in a newer way. And the next thing you know, you two couples could be the best of friends. And that happens in life. I've seen it and experienced it many times. But you got to stand in resilience. You can't lay down like a wet blanket. It says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets which were before you in the olden days. You are the salt of the earth, it says. So keep being the salt. You know, and it just it reminds me a bit of my own story in life. Like I was, uh, I suppose, sold out for the gospel principles. You know, I worked in business. I went away taking some ministry training. I thought maybe helping people on that front was a way to go with the deeper principles of life. But then I realized I was meant to come back into business and start up my training company that I even told my mother when I was six years old, out of the mouth of young boys and babes and young girls, I suppose, Mom, someday I'm going to be the president of a large company. Well, how would a little six-year-old boy even say that or know that? And so you go forth in life, so I came back into business, so the cause is in me. You know I've been married more than once. The mother of my children is my last marriage I had. The good kids, I love them both, Ruby and Winston, and they'll come work with me someday in this company, I hope and believe. And I, they show a lot of interest in me and about it and stuff. And I know they're excited about some of the things I do, and we talk about it on Skype and the Internet, and now Zoom and all that. And my brothers, Rod, and them are glad, Rich, my mother, and everybody's on my side. I've had to come through some, you know, people didn't always see that what I was up to until it became more clear and I've been working hard but this took a lot and I've devoted my life to it well when you get married and I've been more than once you hope someone's on the right track with you where you come together and you're you know put together sort of in a place where you're on the same front or area and uh, you know together yoked and you're kind of going forth equally and even if it's not totally 100%, but you're mostly there. And, uh, you know, and, but then my whole life has fallen apart in terms of marriage and that kind of stuff. And, you know, the family that goes with it, I've had to devote myself to getting my equivocal equal position back and, uh, you know, all that. And there's been a lot of trial in order to be devoted to the cause of these good principles that I wanted to teach in my company. And, uh, you know, I guess, like, uh, what would you think if someone asked you when you married them, you know, will you be here through thick and thin? That's a question when you have a stand before a reverend in a marriage, identifying before God, I suppose. That's a question. But what, what if they said to you, well, will you be here through thick and thin? But then as soon as five years went by and it got into the thick, hard stuff, then you said, well, I'm quitting now. I'm done. And, and like, what would you uh, what would you say if they asked you that up front? Like, are you going to be here when it gets tough? Because it probably will. Life does, you know, at times for people, especially when you're pushing a good cause of anything. And, uh, you know, and what, if, what if they said, yeah, I'll be there, but then they weren't? Or what, what would happen if someone married you, but they didn't even propose the question. They just expected you'd be there. And then instead of asking you, they just started to test you to make sure that you were really, you know, there and committed and, uh, you know, keeping your promises and all that. Well, you don't know how life's going to go. So, I mean, you play your cards and you get the deck you get. And, uh, 
you know, you just do the best you can. So here I am, and I've devoted a lot of my life to preparing for this training company I'm running now, delivering these good principles into the marketplace, both the body, mind, spirit, daily leadership realm and the humanitarian side and the business principles side I'm proposing to you as well for the accommodation of a business consultant making the marketplace happen so businesses stay alive and afloat in these tough COVID times, these end times that are before us. It's only going to says keep getting worse until the end. Like birth pains and contractions uh, where they're increasing in intervals until the birth happens. The eruptions of our total society and disruptions and all of it, earthquakes, everything. And we've seen a lot, but it could get worse. And then there's a time of peace right before the end. Well, I have given my all and I guess what I want to say to you is, you know, if there's opportunities for you to share any of these good principles in your daily life, even with a best friend or a neighbor, where you see someone you know and maybe care about that they don't know stuff you know, you only got to know one more thing than the next person to pass it on. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be an expert trainer. trainer. If you know ABC and your friend only knows AB, well, teach them C. It's that simple. And that's a good way to go. You just always have to be a step ahead in your knowledge if you care about someone that you want to pass something on to them. And I encourage that and promote it. I've always been that way because I've been put in leadership roles in my life where I didn't know a lot, but I knew enough. And I always knew how to get answers for people and go reference things. And I was willing to step into the comfort zone, no, into the uncomfortable because it was about business and helping people and equating making a profit and me making a bonus check and a paycheck to take home to my family, I suppose. So that was good. Now, I go with that, and I want to move on to my last of the three readings. And, uh, you know, if you knew, let's say, for example, I want to give you an example here, an illustration. Let's say you were a welder, and you're going to get a job like Dave the welder in Red Deer, he knew a company would hire him, and there's so many welders, but he had to get certified and pass a test. And Dave, let's say, um, let's say he um, was starting to get ready for the test, and the owner of the company said, here, here's the book, and in this book, all the questions you need to know not the material, but there's some specific questions I'm going to ask you on the test. And those questions are in this book. And you can even look them up there in this one chapter. And you couldn't believe it. Nobody had ever done that to you before. But you still had to go through some effort to find those questions. They were in there. It's like, well, these ten questions, this is what I'm going to be asked on the exam. But wouldn't that be awesome if you knew before the test the questions you were going to be asked? let alone the answers, right? So really, that's in the Bible for our life. Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew about the seven or eight or nine, ten questions that we're going to be asked on the end of our life on Judgment Day. So it would make sense to the welder to know what he had to know and then do it so he could be ready for the test day, just like for us, it would make sense to know well, how am I living my life? What am I going to be asked on the final judgment day? Well, here's what it says. Now, I want to read that to you. And, uh, you know, before I do, a couple things to keep in mind. Faith is important in our entire life. It's just not a Sunday thing. I've always said that. So our belief in ourself before God and our belief in Him that we can live our life and do it and do it well and then pass into the afterlife at the end of it or when he returns. But it says here in the book of Chronicles that the eye of God was searching the whole earth to find anybody with faith and could find none. Not even one. And this was a certain period of, in history. So there are periods in time where people lose faith. My hope for you now in COVID times is you won't lose faith. And it says in the Psalms that even the rocks will cry out to worship the Lord 
if no one has faith. God, you know, he's worthy of being worshipped. And that's what I deem and purport in my Christian faith we're meant to do. It says in Psalm 51, I will not despise you if you have a broken heart and a broken spirit. In fact, I was referring to that earlier in the week. God will actually be pleased with you. It says in Matthew 16, 26, 16, 26, How much would it be worth for a man to try to gain the whole world but yet lose his own soul? What a pity that would be at the end of your life if you didn't pass into the heavenly living forever realm and instead you went into total, like the opposite. You know, so we got to stay focused on, you know, the will of the Lord and what he has planned for our life. And it might not be what the next man or person has. We don't want to lose our whole soul in eternity based on looking for some pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that doesn't exist for our life. And then the last point before I move on to the story of the last day questions I've prayed this for people that we would continue in Luke 50, Luke 2.52. We would continue to grow in wisdom and stature before the Lord and have favor with God and man. Now let's move on over, I suppose, into this uh, last day question. So it starts out, and Jesus, it's in Matthew 25, he's telling the story to his disciples of the, uh, the master and the lazy servant. And then he leads into the last day questions, okay? So he starts out in verse 26. He says, The Lord, his Lord answered him. That was another name for a boss, hey? Like a witness before the Lord or a boss. Said to his servant, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not, and you and gather where I have not strewed. You, and that means like sowed a seed. You ought therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and then at my coming I could have received my own with usury. So what he's telling his servant is that uh, he's telling his servant you know he gave, he gave him some money, a talent and he wanted him to do something with it and instead of investing it while he was away he buried it in the ground and hid it. So it ends up here. He says, Take therefore the talent from him which I give unto him and give it to the guy that I gave ten talents to. So the lazy servant who did nothing with what he was given had that very one thing he was given taken away from him. And that might even be me in my teaching to you. If people do not want to use it, it will be taken away. And I will focus my direction on people that want the teaching and care about it and want to continue to grow. And that is a ancient wisdom scriptural principle here because that is what this master did. And he, and he said, For unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have in abundance. So you can have as much as you want as you want to continue to grow. And that is purposeful. But from him that has not shall be taken away which he has. So if you've been given something and you don't care for it and provide for it right and want to nurture it and grow it more and pass it on to others, it is taken away from you. That's a scriptural ancient history principle. Now he gets into the last day questions as it leads out of that example into this other story here about the end of our life. So listen closely here. It'll transition slowly here. We got about seven more minutes. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man, that's another name for Jesus, shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So there is an end day, he's sitting on the throne of his glory, the judgment seat, and we all face him one by one. And he's miraculous, so he can know all nine billion of us, if that's how many he's on the earth at that time, uh, individually. And before him shall be gatherings of all nations, and he shall 
separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to be a sheep. I want to continue to be a sheep, not a goat. I've never wanted to be a scapegoat by anybody or be made a goat of. A goat is not a good word in the reference here in the Bible. Not an example. He shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then shall the king of glory say unto them on his right hand. Now this is the, the sheep, the good people Jesus has deemed as his own people, God's children. Come ye blessed of my Father, meaning the Father Almighty in heaven, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now this is the example of the questions coming next. For I was a hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me in the hospital or wherever in my home or whatever. You know, that was the example. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungered or, and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee a drink? And Jesus says to them this, When did we, or no, it's, they're still asking, sorry. When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked or clothed you? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come and visit you? And the king shall answer him, king, answer them, King Jesus, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, my children, my brothers, my sisters, you have done it unto me. So those are the gracious things pleasing and perfect to the Lord. And then the opposite happens. Then, then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, the devil's demons. I was a hungered, and you gave me nothing. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. And sometimes you can even substitute with thirsty just the word encouragement in your own demeanor, how you treat people around you. And these are good customer service principles for me to teach because it is about how we treat people as well. Like, treating people matters. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked, you clothed me not. In prison and you visited me not. And then they shall also answer the Lord saying, Well, when did this happen, Lord? When did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked or sick in prison and did not minister unto thee? And now this is important because even people who claim to know the name of Jesus and teach in churches, for example, can miss the point and not be doing any of these things. And this is what matters to Jesus. And then Jesus will answer them and say, Verily I say unto you, as much as you did not do this to one of